let's start with a story, right? And this is my friend, Bob. So I met him first during NS. So he was actually my platoon commander and he grew up in Yishun. And we had, you know, he was my commander. We, we had a good time doing planning. NS was over in two years. And subsequently, we reconnected again in NUS. We met during his NUS days. And this time, he called me. And this was about some four years after graduation. And at that time, he was... Um, what, what actually happened was that he actually sought advice on which BTO project or rather to choose the unit. They were actually already at that stage. But just nice, there was a DBSS project in Ishun at that time. And I thought, hey, that may be better for him because his income was okay. And 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 mind you, at this time, there wasn't EC. So DBSS was the next be best thing. Yep. And we brought him there and he liked it. He bought it. And most important is within five minutes, walk to his parents' house. And subsequently, Bob and Ning had kids. And when I met him again was when his DB, DBSS MOP and he was asking, you know, should, should, should I sell? And, and at that time, my advice to him was that your daughters are still young. You probably still need, both of them are working. They don't have a helper. So their parents provided a lot of support for them. So my suggestion was that perhaps you stay in your DBSS until a later time. And when he had number three, this was the time that he really started to think. Is it enough? Because a four-room flat with his uh, DBSS tends to be a little bit more uh, luxurious in the fittings, but space may be a concern. So this time, we actually did a consultation and to, uh, we, we found that Ying was actually alumni of Holy Innocence and she wanted her, her girls to be in her alma mater. So again, this time we looked around and we saw that there was actually uh, Florence Residences, a good four-bedroom which was within her budget. We sold the DBSS, and at that time, they didn't have the name nor the funds to just buy two. Now, we will always say decoupling, you know. But at that time, the decision was they were still fairly young in their career, and uh, they have good pay, but savings-wise was all stuck in the DBSS. And I think this is probably something that a lot of clients also face. So what was the, you know, the strategy that, was not too common was that we sold their DBSS and they rented nearby Holy Innocence while waiting for the forest residences to TOP. And I think this gamble kind of paid off for them because TFR actually appreciated by some 500 to 600,000, especially for the four beder. Yep. Right. And life goes on. So along while waiting for Flores residences, Bob's dad passed away and his mom was left alone. Now, Bob invited her to his home and this time we met again, but this time was a bit more sober. We decided that it was probably better to sell their issued executive flat and that was done at some 800000 We cashed it out and bought a one-bedroom resale unit. Primo residences, this time is resale. Uh, reason why we couldn't do BUC was it wasn't right. Yeah. <laughs> Because it was on the old lady's name. And it wasn't ethical, uh. Yeah, yeah. So we named bought a one bedroom at 600,000. Today it's rented out at 2008. So if you notice throughout the slides, right, I actually have stars. Right? That actually represents the number of deals per case. So actually, all is well now. Florence Residences has just recently DOP. We did a defects check for them and they are now ready to move in. And that's the end of my story. My friend Bob. But the question is, is it really the end? Is there chapter after this? I think there is. Today, we are probably going to be able to look at, you know, the couple and buy one more, freeing up the uh, Ying's name. Or do we sell off this TFR 4 bit one year later when prices stabilize and upgrade them to a five-room flat? And he has, because he has already tested the, the fruits of new launches, right? He is open to the yeah. whole idea of renting again back, you know, near <clears throat> Holy Innocence to buy a five bedroom. <clears throat> now, the question is, there are many bobs around you, but have you identified them? And if you realize, this is something I'll introduce this term called natural market. Bob is about my age. So we actually, I, a lot of the stages that he was in, I was probably there as well. Yep. So actually, this is something that I would want to perhaps share with everyone here. When you are 
and, and, and the gatherings that you're going to go for the Christmas gatherings or stuff, it's most likely you're going to be, you know, at with your friends. And your friends are going to be about your own age. And um, this natural market I'm talking about is a 10 years your senior, 10 years your junior. So um, even for the upcoming Chinese New Year as well. So you, you identify, right, the stages that they are in and whether if you can introduce a BUC product in and especially about Lentoria because I'm going to, the next part of my presentation, I'm going to share with you why this Lentor area is going to be one of the most exciting products that you can suggest to your client. And I think the important point here is that we do not want to look at it as a product, but rather as a solution to your client's property problems, right? So of course, these questions, I'm sure they are on your mind. There are already three rental sites launched layout. How would the subsequent launches fare? So is there still opportunities that your clients may miss out on? And I think more important, something that bears down on all of us, is the market really slowing down? Should we therefore buy or wait and see? Now, these questions, I'm sure they are on your mind, which is why we have almost 150 of you right here listening to us. And I think the objectives for me today, largely, is to instill confidence that this is not just another launch in Lento, but a solution that you can take advantage of and empower you. Secondly, to promote Lentor to your, to your clients with knowledge and a direction. And of course, most importantly, strategy as well. And lastly, for you to enlighten your clients to invest now. Why now is important in Lentor, in Lentor rather than adopting a wait and see approach. So the point I want to lay across is there is sufficient demand for homeowners in the Lentor Enclave and buyers who, through you, see the opportunity down will win in the long run, right? Now, a lot of what I'm going to say is a bit cheeky, a lot of it personal opinion, but it will probably be something that is able to convince your clients because it is so real, right? So number one, I think what we need to understand is that my first chapter, chapter one, talks about, about investing with the government. Now, a lot of people would have already talked about Singapore is not just a country, but, uh, you know, they run it like a company with very clear KPIs. And, and I think we need to be very nimble to be able to, to be stable and to be able to, to, to survive in the long run. And this is why population becomes a very big topic. And um, population, to me, equal need for homes. And this is something that's very, very relevant in our line of work. Oh, I got ding ding on. <laughs> So, yeah. Now, so this article first came out and there was a lot of debate when it came out in 2013, right? About a 6.9 million population. At that time, we were probably around 5 million, right? And fast forward to today, there's people still talking about this in a negative mode. Don't think so. <laughs> in fact, today, everybody is talking about it. And I think... um. Talking about something real, right? Uh, in terms of population and density, uh, do you all realize that we Singapore we are actually more dense than Hong Kong? I feel so. You feel so? Yeah. Yeah, but but you realize that there is still space for you and me. When we go to the malls, we go to the parks, we take the trains, we are still okay, right? Yeah. But Hong Kong, even though they are less dense than us, but they feel a lot more packed. And I think this has to be something that we have to accord our, our, our government to through proper planning, through a decentralization, which is why you hear, I mean, all of us here are professionals. You have definitely heard about the various regional plans to move the second CBD. I mean, those who have sold this, Jaden sold really well. Singaporeans are taking yep. to that whole idea. Pai Lei Ba, do brilliantly well as well. So, and now the next one is actually Woodlands. So there are many of these regional disposal, the disposal plans that help to bring, you know, to make Singapore a lot more livable. And I think this, uh, why I highlighted this is because this was actually published exactly 10 years ago. And a lot of times when we, 
I, I don't know about you, but every year when there's a budget, when there's a rally, when the PM talks, we all listen. Why? Because it is something like a crystal ball into the future. Where the opportunities are, where should I bring my clients to? And most importantly, where should we invest? Now, this is something like that as well. 10 years ago, they set the stage that they will want to achieve a 6.9. And at the time, there were a lot of naysayers. They say, no, that's too much. Yep. But I remember there's a, also a certain professional uh, Mr. Liu Taika, they suggested perhaps even 6.9 is not enough. Not enough, yeah. We should be looking at 10. Now, let's look at the numbers now. Okay, if you look at the, these are from the uh, Singapore Statistics this morning, right? You look at, 20, uh, I highlight you to 2013 when the white paper came out. Total population was 5.4 million, right? And if you look at now, 2023, is uh, 5.917, right? Hang on, let me just get my notes out for this. Yeah. Sometimes I get overexcited and I'm panting a little. Is it because <laughs> government gives the budget? Yeah. $200, government. $500. Oh, that one maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, coming coming soon. Uh. <laughs> uh, just in case you guys have your use up your CDC voucher <laughs> because you are coming out another, oh, I'll pay one modding very fast. <laughs> okay. So anyway, let's look, uh, look, let's look at the numbers, yeah? So actually in uh, 2013 to 2019, right? You realize that in terms of percentage, we are at a almost sub 2%. We are not, we are, we are growing less than 2%. And I think the next highlight was actually in 2021, whereby we actually had a drop by four point, minus 4.1%. Now, Donovan, can, can, can you perhaps share why? Do you, what do you think? Why, why we have actually a population down? I don't know. I know, but personally, I feel that, you know, like last time people mm. used to get like, PR permanent resident <laughs> easier uh -huh. then I don't know whether there's any like curve or bell curve currently okay. you know okay I, I, I'll just go straight to answer yeah? I think some of us here already got it already what happened in 2021 we need to look back right so what happened in 2019 and 2020 there's this big letter <laughs> four letter no, five letter words Co 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 COVID. COVID. COVID yeah so COVID actually restricted travel a lot of uh, people went back and then if you look at the uh, under PRs and uh, non-residents that number dropped so a lot of the the the, the, the so-called decrease is attributed to PRs and non-residents locals actually we are still you know, it's just a little bit of a, <laughs> okay, someone's yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Hang on, let me just help to mute. Not too fast, it's okay, no? Yeah. So anyway, let's let's go back to the topic. So if you notice there was a there was a post-COVID, there was a drop of 4.1%. And very quickly we covered in 2022, whereby we saw a 3.4% increase. And of course, from last year to this year, we actually registered another impressive 5%. And we are now at 5.9 million. So if we take a conservative 2% growth year on year from 2023, uh, mind you, uh, 2022 and 2023, we already saw 3.4 and 5%. So I'm taking a very conservative uh, expo, you know, figure here, we are talking about 2%, we are actually going to hit 6.8 by 2.2030. So it is uh, when, when, they, when they set that target 10 years ago, it is not unreachable. In fact, um, it has happened and it's probably going to happen. And if I take the liberty of, um, sorry, if I take the liberty of actually doing up the sums to show you at 2% to 2.4, does this sound like price matrix? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this, if you look at it, right, actually the number that they probably based on was probably between 2.3 to 2.4% growth year on year. And, and, and we do, yeah, you can see, if we take a 2.4, we actually get 6.9 million, which is thereabouts. But again, I'm being conservative here. 2%, we're still going to be 6.8. Nevertheless, if you take that number, we are expected to see an increase of 987,199 number of packs. And I think what we need to be sure as uh, to be to, to, to look deeper right into this data is also we need to calculate, we need to see our population. So our population is actually shrinking. In terms of organic citizen, if we are just counting on me and Donovan to to, to you know have babies. <laughs> <laughs> right so our our fertility rate is actually 1.2 so um growth rate you can see 
2018, there was a really a negative, right? It was only in 2019 when I think government gave a lot more uh, help uh, in terms of uh, COVID healthcare. Help, uh. COVID help, I think. Yeah, 2019. COVID yes. also <laughs> help. Yeah, yeah. COVID that time cannot go out. Uh. <laughs> Right, so COVID help one thing, but I think it's also the concerted efforts of the government to, to put quite yeah. a fair bit of resources into into you know, um, childcare into subsidies into well. subsidies, and I think the working mothers uh subs the income tax uh, rebate was yep. was good as well, and also uh parents leave. So there were a lot of these things that, but even with these right, you realize that we are still very constant at one point two. So with this uh birth rate uh fairly constant of 1.2, much of this increase of 987, or rather over almost a million people, will most likely be fueled by new citizens and foreigners. Now, if I bring you back to the chart just now, you realize that the number of PRs are actually fairly constant at 500,000, but the non-residents are also has seen a, a very big increase, increase yep. over the years. Now, I would say that a lot of PRs are constant because probably a large number went over to the citizen portion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think those of us who are doing quite a fair bit of rental or expat market will know that uh, quite a fair number of our tenants in the last two years have actually gotten PR a citizenship Citizen. and then asked us to help them buy HDB flats. <laughs> yeah. So that is something that is real. And I think uh, what we observe on ground is also in line with uh, data. Right, and now, so what is the implication of this nine hundred eighty-seven thousand? And I would say let's take a sixty percent bin, citizens and foreigners. Now, citizens and foreigners, they are grown ups. Even with families, they would need homes. And if you look at the average household size of Singapore, we have actually since twenty thirteen when they announced the six point nine million, it was at about three point five. Today, we are probably closer to three. So if you just take a simple, the number of people divided by the household size, we are probably require from now to 2030, another 320,000 homes. So that actually helps to explain why the state is actually releasing a lot of uh, BTOs. We see a huge slate of BTOs, uh, many GLS as well, yep. right? So that is all to help, I think, to anticipate and to get ready for this population. And again, mind you, we are taking a very conservative 2%. We probably, if uh, if we, you know, if we know how our government works, probably we may get six, if, if everything is rosy, lah, right? Probably we'll hit 6.9, probably one or two years earlier, right? So now, take away points, right? Take away points. This is the part that usually we'll take out our phones and start to, Screen, huh? <laughs> so 6.9 million population by 2030 most likely will happen. Increase of almost 1 million from 2023 to 2030. And most of these will be new citizens and foreigners who need homes immediately for purchase or rent. And uh, 320,000 new homes are needed. Whether is it HDB, private, but generally new homes. Yeah. So this is the first takeaway point, population equal need for homes and I hope that resonates in all of us. Now second point is it, of investing with the government is that home ownership in cult cultivates that sense of home and that's important. Okay let's look at the home ownership numbers okay from 2014 to 2020 you realize that Singapore is very constant at about 90 percent so it hoovers up and down very normal right but again, you notice in 2021, there's a drop to 87.9%. Now, Donovan, I'm going to ask you the question again. What do you think happened? <laughs> yes, you can ask me a question. So what do you think happened between 2020? Why, what, what constitutes that 2021 drop to 87.9%? Is it a file at all? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, you're right. So COVID actually caused a lot of people at that time. I, I remember there was, um, even myself, I was telling my wife, Jasmine, when, uh, you know, the the first onslaught of COVID, I think, hey, I think don't need to do property. Now. We can go and eat on our savings and, and, take and, a break, and uh. have more children. Yeah. <laughs> 
But we were busier than ever, and, and, and I think we were doing a lot more deals uh, through, uh, and, and it forced a very big technology upgrade. Yeah. Today, we are doing Zoom, largely also because of COVID, of COVID yes. pushed that adoption very quickly. And uh, we were doing, uh, you know, Zoom viewings, we were doing a lot of uh, tech stuff. And, and, and a lot of people actually believe prices will drop. So I, I, I actually personally dealt quite a number whereby they sold at the onslaught, hoping that, thinking that prices will actually drop. But actually, they, the uh, opposite, happened. The opposite yeah. happened. And a lot of those people who were timing the market, who were reading that market, who and who think that Singapore prices will drop over the long run, yeah. actually, I don't think they are doing very well today. So actually, that's also another point that you perhaps can 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 put in your repertoire of uh, topics to talk to your clients that uh, during the this season, because they'll ask you, should buy now or not? Now so high. Actually, Singapore, uh, there's no more buy low, sell high. La. Just buy high, sell higher. So the most important answer you should give is you should buy now. Yes. Buy now, buy young, the younger that you can and buy the biggest that you can. And now, and, but what you can see is that we recovered very quickly. In 2022, you see a sharp increase of almost 1% to 88.9. And despite 2022, 2023, I think most of us here would agree that Prices have hit a, a new high. In fact, um, back then in 2018, I was saying 1.5 million is the new 1 million. And then uh, we were probably going to hit 2 million being the new 1 million. I would dare say today, you're looking at the prices, we're looking at 2.2 or 2.3 being the new 1 million. And even with this kind of climate, you see home ownership continuing to go up from 88.9 to now at 89.3%. And I think, again, uh, don't take my word for it. History tends to repeat itself. If you look at 2014 to 2020, that's a good in, in uh, you know, good seven years for you to to see where it will go. So I'm I'm pretty confident 2024, 2025, we should see it breaking past 90% again. Right? Um, yeah, 90%. And then that's just in line with what we have traditionally uh, achieved in Singapore. And why is that so? Right? Because the government and is generally, you know, uh, encouraging people to buy homes. And I think it helps that there's quite a, there's 30,000 of us helping them to buy homes as well. Yeah. And agents are not the only ones that's helping them to buy homes. The banks are helping as well. And of course, uh, CPF helps a lot. I think a lot of Singaporeans today, they would agree they may they may not be too happy with certain aspects of CPF, but then I think they would all agree that without CPF, a lot of them would not have yeah. homes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at the numbers, right, our total loans for owner-occupied homes are still a, a almost three, almost three times that of that of investment property. So a lot of the homes of this 90% we're talking about are still very much owner-occupied. And of course, if you look at the um, Amount drawn using CPF, very constant as well for private and HDB uh, rentals. Now, why do I want to bring up, you know, housing loans and CPF? Again, the, you know, the nicer way of saying it is sense of belonging. La. But actually most with um, a cheeky, cheeky questions here. La. If today you and me have huge home loans, and you know we need the CPF to pay the home loan. Are we less likely to switch or stop working? So the chances of us firing the boss not very high. No. <laughs> cheeky question, cheeky question. Just for just the for discussion sake. Big uh. commitment. Uh, so commitment actually does help. You know, hold you to the job. Yeah. So and 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 that actually once you have that the whole remember my one of my opening sentences think of Singapore as a company so we need all our uh, stakeholders to be committed to the cause so actually home ownership sense of home sense of belonging is a very important part of our total defense as well and now if you look at this take away, po take away points home ownership equal to a sense of home right home ownership is a tenet in Singapore's policy Singapore actually very very actively pursue this policy and we see a post-COVID revival in home ownership uh, in 2022 and 2023 and possible return to a pre-COVID 90%. Most home loans are secured using 
you know, most homes are secured using loans repaid by CPF. And therefore, this policy is likely to continue as we go forward for the next five to 10 years or, or probably a lot more longer, a lot longer. longer yeah. and, and of course, uh, I think just to highlight again, PM Lee has just handed over the reins to the next generation P of, of, uh, of the leadership. And uh, Lawrence Wong, I think, would probably very much uh, may, I mean may, again, I can't speculate, may continue this, 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 this policy, right? And now my third point of investing with the government is social mobility is equal to a sense of hope. Now I'll explain a little bit on what social mobility means. Social mobility actually largely from a government's perspective is also another one of those tenet, uh, tenet policies whereby is to encourage families to know that they can, you know, uh, they can move up the social ladder. Uh, and basically it's the whole basis of meritocracy whereby it doesn't matter who you're born, who you're born to, whether you're rich or poor, as long as you work hard, you study hard, you have a, a opportunity to, 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 to be better than your, your parents. And I think a lot of this social mobility, uh, you know, possibility is what why our parents keep asking us to study hard when we're young. Huh? When you go up, go and be a lawyer and doctor. Remember when you go up, got people, well, our parents say, go up, be a property agent. No, la, don't have. Don't have. Don't, have. Yeah. <laughs> don't be. Don't be. Yeah. <laughs> but I think today is changing. I think uh, both myself and Donovan are good examples of actually property agent can still yang jia hu kou, right? So I think social mobility is something that is really you know, important. And there is a lot of actually a uh, correlation, okay, between social mobility and property locations, especially in areas with perceived good primary schools. Now, now cheeky question again, uh, you know, every time I say cheeky question, you all look up. Uh. If you look at the top 10 primary schools in Singapore, and I just want to highlight, uh, primary schools top 10 ranking is not by you know, how high their students score in PSLE, it's not how fast their students run, how fast their students swim, but simply how difficult it is to get in, right? And typically those with uh, schools with a longer history tend to have that. But the tricky question here is, if you look at the top 10 primary schools in Singapore, which neighbourhoods are they in? Now, Donovan. Top 10, huh? Okay. Only, only no one. Is it CHIJ sending us to school? <laughs> no, no, let, let, let's be more fair. Now, the fa most famous one is probably Nanyang Primary School. Now, where is it? Nanyang? Ah. Mm. I don't know. You enlighten me. Uh, today, today, we ERA project. So, we'll sell everything. <laughs> right. No, Nanyang, right? Which is a project that did very well? Wharton. Yeah. Right. Then, Rosai? Recent ones. Recent ones. Recent ones. Most recent ones. Uh, uh, infinity. infinity. Uh, Considered? Uh, but actually, Rosa a lot landed there, ma. Yeah, la. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, hundred pumps, right? Is it hundred oh, pumps? That's the EC, yeah. That's the EC, yeah. right? One day sold. One day sold out. Why? Largely because of that. School, right? yes. Schools. Now, the next one we talk about is of course Saint Nicholas Girl School. Now, yes, Saint Nicholas Girl School is something. This one I know. That, uh, you know, uh, yeah. The rest are like not very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Saint Nicholas Girl School is another one, and and I think for Lentorio, can you tell me how many of our units or blocks are inside? The one kilometer, according to the one map, dot gov dot sg, uh, yes. I think it's the entire project. Yeah. So you heard it right, now. Uh. Oh, every single unit in our project is actually within the one kilometer range of uh, SNGS. Yeah. And that's actually again, you know, something that's in line with what our government do, and uh, and also the uh, public's uh, perception of what social mobility is, which is actually linked to prop good schools and good schools linked to good real estate, right? And if you look at the Singapore, we actually top Southeast Asia in social mobility. So this is not something that, you know, the government says they want to work hard at, but didn't achieve, they actually do achieve. And if you look at the definition here, as I've shared earlier, social mobility is defined as the ability of a child to have a better life than their parents and the impact of their social economic success on their life. Right? So, social mobility. Remember Bob? Yeah? So, if you remember his story, do you realize that his was that of uh, moving up the social ladder as he improves on his job? 
and his is it and 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 the question that I have earlier is it the end? It's not because after HDB to the private, we have secured their consumption basis, and basically the strategy that their first two properties have uh, uh, you know be it their DBSS to the foreign residences, their first two properties are at very very much consumption based, buying as big as they can, but once they reach a point whereby they can settle their consumption, the next steps is actually, again, investment. Yep. And that's actually part of the entire social mobility you know, story as well. And now I think something that also as I go about my work and I have three kids, right? I, I, I sometimes ask my wife, you know, well, at the rate that prices are going today, uh, next time, what are they going to stay? <laughs> and my, and Zach, well, our PG leaders will yeah. always say, it doesn't matter because they don't even worry about the kids. This generation, the parents have already done what they can to prepare for their for for their next generation already. Now, so takeaway points for social mobility or the sense of hope is that it gives a sense of hope to the populace, and there is very strong correlation between this social mo mobility and the real estate. And an upgrade in real estate often reflects an upgrade in life and life status as well. So. If you look at this, uh, the government also inculcates this very subtly. Vouchers and as you no know, vouchers and assistance are largely based on the type of dwelling one stays in. So if you stay in a HDB three room today, never mind that you have a million dollars, two million dollars, or even three million dollars in your savings, you actually get a lot more CDC voucher than that poor, you know, retiree in a landed home. Yeah. What what we call the asset rich but cash poor generation. And and that's that's real, right? And even, uh, yes, very publicly say, you know, the government has used property as a means of taxing the rich. And you can see that through the ABSD, increased property tax for, and it's coming, 2024 is coming, right? So these are all that, that and, and, and it, it all just shows in reality what, you know, where the government is, is going with this whole social mobility thing. And it's important because it, again, gets the people to work and to have a direction and a target to work towards, right? Now, plan chapter two, okay? So chapter one largely is about investing with the government. And so far, we have seen that they, they know what they're doing. They plan way ahead and they make it happen. Yep. So this is just on a broad picture. And I think what I want to be able to instill in all of us is the confidence that overall in the next 10 years, we are in good hands in terms of uh, population growth uh, with, again, prices may fluctuate up and down, but I think in terms of uh, overall direction, we should be able to see a, a very safe, you know, increase in, uh, you know, demand for property. Now, chapter two, we are talking about more so on the planning perspective and what's the plans that affect this whole growth. And I think, uh, again, this being the fourth project in Lento, I think a lot of the data, a lot of the facts, a lot of the uh, more, you know, detailed information has already been shared by the, the other leadership teams. Now I'm going to just perhaps do a more, again, you know, personal, you know, uh, opinion of the, of the whole whole plan. I mean, again, having been traveling down every single day for the last five years from, 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 from Sambawang down Thompson Road and all the way to Topayo, right? So let's look at this. And I think the main uh, plan about this is actually the North-South Corridor. Now, by and large, the North-South Corridor is here. It's a transport uh, system. Uh, replicate or rather running parallel to CTE to bring to connect the people of Sambawang to downtown Rocho. And if you look at the plan that is uh, showing, you will do see quite a number of points. Okay, we have Sambawang, we have Amokyo Avenue 6, that's where the exits are. We have Bishan, we have Novena, Rocho, and downtown, right? And if you look at all this, right, there are actually uh, growth plans for this area. Sambawang, it has already happened. We see a lot of BTOs, a lot of ECs 
uh, operating there. Amokyo Avenue 6, although they call it Amokyo Avenue 6, I think they are referring to the Lanto Enclave where we are at. And Bishan, Bishan is interesting as well. If you look at the Master Plan 2014 versus Master Plan 2018, you will see that there are a lot of plots in the right next to Sky Habitat and Sky View being changed from residential to commercial. Now, that's another good indicative of the bigger North Plan that I'm going to talk about. And going down, you see Novena. Novena, when you, if you are a driver and you drive there, you'll probably curse and swear half the time because <laughs> the, you never know where the road the, the diversions are. And Rocho downtown. Now, this is where the whole District 7 you know, uh, transformation is, and which is why we have sold quite a number of the Midtown, the M, you know. I think uh, lastly, the latest one to come up would be the uh, project by Far East. The old golden mouth, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So so basically I think it's all transformation, yes. right? And 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 they are all the individual transformations that you have heard from the other leadership teams of the other project. But what I want to perhaps uh, highlight here is that if we see them as a whole, right? If we see them as a whole, what are the opportunities that we have? Right? And what are the, some of the more subtle ones that have not been? I think they gave given a very broad uh, overview, but what are some of the more subtle ones that perhaps have not been uh, publicly shared? So let's let's look at it, right? So if you look at it, uh, are we really just connecting Sambang to downtown? Okay, I think uh, immediately I'm going to ask a very personal question. Uh, have you tried going to an expressway from Sambawang? Seldom. 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 I, mean, I, I do that every day. Uh, to go to, uh, there are only two ways. Uh, either you drive 15 minutes to go to SLE from Woodlands Avenue 9, or you drive down to Yishun Avenue 1. Okay. Either way is 15 minutes. Uh, and then coupled with the morning jam, uh, it's quite jala. So a lot of people thought that, hey, you know, NSC is just for that. But actually, no. As I've shared earlier on, it's probably a much bigger plan than that. And I'm going to go to the more subtle ones now. Okay. They look at all the news. Now, there's also a Woodlands. What they didn't put in the bigger map just now is the entire Woodlands Regional Plan which is very big. We also have the uh, the Singapore Johor RTS. So I just went in JB to buy some furniture. And that day I was driving across the causeway on my right. Wow, I can see they're building it really fast, yeah. the MRT. And of course, there's also, even with that news, a lot of uh, projects in JB are selling a little better with the whole premise of having people work in Singapore and taking the train to go there. Yeah. yeah. So this whole thing, I think, majority that would there be people doing that I think so but majority of people over some time will find that it may be a little bit too much of a hassle, much of a hassle. but on weekends it will definitely be a good time to be able to donate to jam uh, that day I jam 6 hours by the way <laughs> okay if we don't have to jam right we'll probably just take the train much faster and and I think that helps to if you look at the North Plan as starting from Malaysia now it looks like now you can understand why they invest so much you know, into this entire thing. Now, definitely you want to look at starting from Malaysia, coming down to the Woodlands Regional Centre, whereby they are going to do it into a very, one of the largest, if not the biggest economic hub in the North region, which is why we have uh, quite a number of land being uh, sold there for commercial users as well. Uh, industrial, uh, a lot of units, a lot of the sites there are getting, uh, you know, uh, revitalised as well. And, then we have, of course, it ends off with the uh, Rocho area. So if you start from the north being Malaysia, and then the south as uh, Rocho, the D7 transformation, you see a very interesting uh, growth story, right? And Lentor, and of course the Lentor site, Lentoria, especially, yeah. is right smack in the center. Yep. So it's... Not north, not overly north, not overly south, right in the center exactly. where it is perfect, I would say, for Singaporeans to stay, right? It is able to go up to take advantage of the north economic hub and also down to the new downtown uh, transformation. Now, I'm going to go to the more subtle portions now, right? So if you look at the Sambawang Canberra area, I think earlier on, uh, before, you know, Canberra MRT just opened about two to three years ago. And the BTOs that were that were provided in the Canberra area earlier on weren't exactly very popular. So I think at that time, a three-bedroom was about 200 to 280,000. Three-bedroom was about 
four three hundred plus to four hundred. I think five room is about four hundred each. Ah, four hundred four hundred. Yeah. But now on the resale side, have you seen have uh, have you seen the prices? It's a bit crazy, eh? Yeah. So I sold I sold uh, a few there recently, and we are able to hit seven to eight hundred thousand for the five rooms. Five room. Mind you, seven to eight hundred thousand used to be only in the region of the central area or Ang Mo Kio or Tupayo, but now even in Canberra, a brand new area. And it's not difficult to know why, because I would say Canberra is very well planned. Every few clusters they have they have uh, a coffee shop. Every few coffee shop clusters they actually have a supermarket. supermarket. So every it is really very well planned. And this is a, a, a again in line with what we talked about in, 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 uh, earlier whereby we had the decentralization. And we of course we also have the Canberra Plaza, which is a little HDB mall, but surprisingly it's quite well run. And 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 we do see quite a lot of services, you know, that you can get there. Now, I want to highlight this is because this area suddenly now become very popular. And it actually forms a very good basis for a lot of the another interesting thing around this area is that you realize there's many, many plots of ECs. Yeah. So let's just start to name a few. First one would be Sky Park. Yes. I think I, I, one of our DD stays there. Uh, second one, Park Life. Then Visionaire, Brownstone. Yes. And those are just the first batch. First, few, yes. first batch. And then a, a little bit more down, you have one Canberra. And now the newer batch, you have your Provina, uh, province, Pro province yeah. residences, uh, Park Canberra. Yeah. And then I think a little bit towards the issue inside now, Gaia. Now, you, you can see there's really all this ECs if there's not enough people there, they will not. They will, would they would they want to move there? Exactly. And right now, if you look at the empty plots between Canberra and Sambawang, they actually have uh, released more industrial plots, uh, uh, for for JTC factories, flatted factories, and also a lot of BTOs are in that area. So this is again part of the entire North South plan. And again, we don't have to guess. There is a entrance to the North South Corridor right at Gambas, which is actually very, very near to all these new development areas. Right? So this is just a little bit more subtle. But I think some of us would know, especially those of us who do the North uh, HDB houses. Now, this is probably something that's a little bit more silent. I don't think I've tried to find, you know, uh, information online, but we don't see. But I think something that we can observe is that if you drive down that road every day, like myself, you will realize there's a lot of constructions on the right side, uh, which is currently uh, labeled as DP Barracks Guards. So that's the actually the old guards camp. The guards have moved to the east already. And uh, it was, I think, very silent or quiet for a while. But now, if you look, the entire stretch is actually a huge construction. And a lot of the uh, what we see seems like, again, this is guesstimate. Huh? <laughs> it seems like to me a very possible chance that Tatip Camp may move over to these new barracks. Again, I have to clarify these are opinions. Yeah. This is not yeah. anything official. There's nothing official. And why is because actually, if you look at the position of Tatip Camp, it's actually very near Tatip MRT. Right? Very, very near. And, and if you look at the all the under long time Hua Ting, Blooms and Greens. I think there's a very famous restaurant there that was also relocated. Uh, Orchard, uh, Yishun or Orchid, that's about the, the, yeah, the, the Orchid, Orchid live seafood. seafood. Live seafood. Yeah, that has been uh, It's moved. at the Yishun home, home team NS. Yeah, so it has moved, they, they moved them there about two, or, I think three, three years yeah, ago. Before. Yeah, and of course the more famous one would be Otto. Who, which was uh, taken back. And then now if you drive, it is no longer uh, a green. So if you look at this whole area where the MRT is, what do we see again? All being clipped. Opportunities. Opportunities, right? And and if you look at the whole correlation that we've been talking about, you know, from the beginning about population studies, social mobility and all that, and connecting the north with the south, this is a very integral portion in the grand scheme of things because they've built all the ECs, right? If you look yeah. at it this way, uh, using a social mobility concept, today BTO sell, I need to go to a condo, right? But don't have EC new launch because all sold out already. So what do I do? I buy the fire MOP ECs, uh, 
So the Fire MOPEC guys, they made 600,000. They moved somewhere. They moved somewhere, right? So either they, a small portion of them moved back to HDB, but now government say cannot. Cannot. You need to wait 15 months. Doable? If I don't want to wait. Uh, if you don't want to wait, what can you do? Yes. Buy resale. But resale, but they tasted new launch before. Eh. So what do they do? Reinvest. Reinvest. Rebuy into another new launch. Yep. And that is why at Christmas, you tell them about Lentoria because Lentoria is that perfect product that you can move them in line with this North plan towards a great area. And again, if you look at the whole timeline, it just works well for Lentoria. Lentoria launched in 2024, probably 2028, they're going to be ready, right? This area, if it, we are probably going to hear, you know, some form of a BTO sometime soon. Yeah. Right? And they take time to build. By the time they're ready, and would there be possibility that are ECs here? I think that may be given the popularity. So I think it is just that whole link of moving downwards and uh, you know, that demand uh just makes it important that you go into Lento now and wait for this to happen to, to, to happen in the future. Right? And of course the next one is the spring leaf and lento. Right, I'm coming nearer and nearer to the north already, uh, to the south already. Now, spring leaf is very is quite interesting because other than huge landers on the right side and that line of uh, shop houses, you actually realize that there's a whole empty tech on the right side of spring leaf, and yet they open it up. This is important to me because there was a time when a uh, Senet was not when Woodley MRT was not called Woodley, it was called Senet, and it was built but not open. And look where Woodley now is probably one of the more desirable areas to yeah. see, right? So I, I foresee something happening on the spring leaf side. And I think it's also a very good, you see all the forested area. I see a lot of opportunities there as well. And it links down, of course, to the Lentor area. Now, if you look at the Lentor area specifically, you realize that that's probably the end of the entire North plan. Why? Because... It's literally one street away from what traditionally we would think as a mature estate, which is Amokyo. Yeah. So most people would say, actually, we are already in Amokyo. So can I therefore say that we are the most south of the north area? And that's where the concentration where all the lentil sites are. And of course, if you look at the, the correlation between these clusters of BTO, I've already shared with you all, the, there is a very strong correlation when they build the BTO, ECs, and private property because they want to encourage that property uh, flow. And why, you know, again, for hey, school know, to be popular, school, 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 school to be popular. Yeah, so for, for, proper, for a school to be popular, it needs time, right? right? Yep. So I think you look at the entire north you have Aitong, you have SNGS, they're all actually near the Lento area. So actually that's, again, another very good you know, point that you can talk about if, you're, if your clients ask, about, is there any good opportunities out there that they can look at? And I think this is probably another uh, you know, interesting things that you can talk. And um, some of the cheeky questions, if you ask them, I think it's also a very interesting uh, talking point. So now the takeaway points for this, my, my portion here is that Lentor, the whole enclave, is actually at the tip of this great north plan, right? And there's a lot of infrastructure investments that the government is putting in. And we have seen how, you know, uh, these investments help to bring up the value of the entire area. One cl most classic example is Canberra, whereby the PTOs there are on 2.5 to 3 times. And that's actually uh, performing above even some of the more so-called established uh, yeah. market. It's because they invest in an area that's not been developed yet, right? And I think if you look in specific to the uh, land hall itself, uh, which Donovan will share more in detail later, is that the government chose to release the five plots of GLS in a relatively short time. And I guess this was to actually to stabilize prices at the primary spot. And I don't think there's oversupply because, again, if you've seen how the government works, they first, it actually helps them a lot more if they release plot by plot right? To achieve a higher price. Yep. But I don't think that's what they want that's, to achieve. I don't think that's the objective. <laughs> that's not the objective. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice byproduct, but it's definitely not the objective. And what we see is that by releasing so many sites in such a short time, it actually, uh, uh, you know, gets the developers to bid a little bit more cautiously to know that there's a lot of supply. Yeah. But overall, I think the supply would 
the laptop. And I think we can also consider the Lentor 11 plots as two big projects. And the first five plots where Lentoria is, upcoming Lentor mentioned as well, total 2474. And mind you, out of this 2474, I think almost more than a thousand plus units have already been and taken up. Yeah. And we are, two new projects haven't launched yet. So it, the, actually silently, the area is, there so is a more than 50%. More than 50%. Yeah. And, and, and this is the part that we would invite all of you to be part of this story as well. Now, I've come to the end of my portion. I'll stay on for questions later. And now I'll hand over to Donovan, who will give you a deeper you know, insight into why Lentoria is the product that you should recommend to your client. Over to you, Donovan. Thank you, Christopher, for sharing. Right. So right now, I'll take over and uh, maybe we'll dive a little bit um, in detail on uh, the Lentor. So chapter three, we're talking about Lentor focus. Okay. So how's the market? looking right now, right? So for the government land sale prices, you know, since 2015 to 2023, just focusing on OCR itself, it has grown like 71%, right? So what does this mean in terms of new launches is 71% um, growth, right? Comes down to the next thing, which is on top of that, right? There is also rising construction costs. Right? Since 2015 to second quarter of 2023, has increased for 31% as well. So increase in government land sale price and rising construction costs will also mean that uh, there's an increase in launch prices. Okay. So what's the OCR benchmark price right now? So in 2019, 2020, 2021, right, during the COVID period, right, the launch prices of the leftover projects, 1006 to 2009 for yeah. OCR. Yeah, really? I remember 2018, I think 5th of July, that's the day that caused the, the, the ABS dating, right? Yeah. That night, we sold uh, a few projects, Sterling Residences, people, 1006, so expensive. Yep. That time, why you make me buy? Then uh, TOP. That time, why you never forced me to buy, buy two units? Buy more, right? Uh, buy yeah. more. Why you never forced me to buy two units? I actually got this is a real case. Not enough name. La. Not enough name. Yeah. Yeah. So, we look at the current OCR launch price. Mm. You know, it's 2001 conservatively, you know, in an average of 2,001 per square foot, right? But these are things that it's really beyond our control, you know, land price and, and construction costs, right? So we talk about performance in the OCR area, right? Since last year, we just take mark, benchmark from one year ago, right? Average price increased 62%, but does that mean that there's no volume? No, right? Because again, supply and demand, volume went up by 165%. Okay, then let's zoom down to new launches in District 26 itself, mm. right? Uh, growth since 2019, you know, the last quarter to date, the fourth quarter of 2023, and we haven't come to the end of the year, you yeah. know? So average price is 52%. So all I'm trying to say is this 52% increment is something that we can't control because of GIS land sale and construction costs. However, if you guys were to take note, the quarter three 2022 to Q4 2023, prices are, are rather, you know, stable and, and stagnant. And that also gives buyers yeah. confidence to enter into the market. I, I think this, I wouldn't call it stagnant, but I think it's more of a controlled kind of, again, Growth. in line with, uh, you know, the five plots, I would say. Yep. I think the government is stepping up to, to regulate prices. Again, you know, cooling measures, same thing, you know, say when you're on an aircon, you don't on it till you're freezing, right? It's, it's, it's just, I would say this is to to hold prices as primary source. Like, and I think it's working, especially in this in this area. But as I've, we have shared earlier on the macro picture on uh, population growth and government direction, it, it, it's definitely, you know, um, justifiable. And in line with what, in the, line with yeah, what we're observing. It's to keep prices stable and make, uh, property affordable and if you are entering now when it's stable when it becomes unstable in the future because we have already seen that you know again population growth just at two percent but if it grows more yep then actually it may become unstable again and that's where you will make your extraordinary profit yep okay so let's talk about this <laughs> everyone wants to talk about Jaden they right? got champagne <laughs> <laughs> right oh it's Jaden did exceptionally well, right, during the launch day. Okay, so what's the point of us talking about Jaden, right? So um, let's look at their one beta. One beta 
527 square feet transacted. The, these are the latest uh, transactions. Uh, 2008 per square foot, right? They are two beta, 2006 per square foot. Three beta, 2005 per square foot. Four beta can go up to as high as, yeah. Two five, two so, five, two six. yeah, I mean, what's, what's the point of me talking about this? It's why Jaden did so well, right? And number one is because a lot of people are talking about, oh, our buyers are, there are a lot of buyers in the market. People are just waiting. And waiting for what? Waiting for the right product, right? Because when it comes down to affordability, right? These are the prices that Singaporeans can afford. Right. When, when we talk about uh, property price increasing, new launches are getting more expensive. Right. But the truth is, people are still buying. It really boils down to the product. I think it boils down to whether the people are buying through you. <laughs> Correct. And that's something that, that is within our control and definitely we need to reflect on. Yes. And which is why you're all attending today's session to find out why you should sell <laughs> an <Antora. laughs> Yeah. So what we are trying to say that actually, you know, people are still confident in the property market. Definitely. Yeah, right. it's just the type of product. Okay. So these are the comparison in terms of the uh, six plots. Lah. Okay, the five, six plots of, of land that has really been bidded. So um, Lentore is uh, developed by TID, which was also involved in uh, Lentor Hills residences. Uh, okay. So I think for TID to take up plot for Lentoria at 1130 per plot ratio just shows how much confidence they have in this Lentor enclave, yep. right? Okay, performance on launch day. So on launch day for the over the three other projects that was launched previously, so Lentor Modern was sold at 84% on day one, Lentor Hills was at 50% and Hillock Green at 28%, right? So as of today, right, um, Lentor Modern is 97% sold. Lentor Hills is 70, almost 73%. Almost uh, 15, 15%? Yeah. From day one? Correct. Yeah? Correct. Mm. Right. And Lentor Hills? Lentor Hills launch day was 50. Now they are at 72. Close to 73. And that's only like in less than three months? This is, yeah, just in, just in a few months, right? Yeah. So, a total we have 1,161 units sold to date. Right? And so, the total supply, if we have checked earlier, the 2474. Two, four, four. So, yeah. actually, there is... A good, good supply. More, so, almost so, 50%. Correct. Yeah. So actually units in, in Lenton are still moving, right? So if you do monitor closely, you know, actually people are still buying into the Lenton area, yep. right? So it can be because of OCR, you know, the, the price point of view or the growth in Lenton area. But it just shows that there's longevity and, and confidence in the Lenton and Cliff, yep. right? And I think we, we did quite well for... Hill Lock Green last last week, right? Yeah. Three units were sold. Three units, yes. Yeah. I think yeah. ERA sent out, right? Yeah, the, that was yes, just yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. that's right. Mm. So, averagely, if you were to compare the three projects, right, Um, average price transacted 1,008 to 2,004, I mean, for the for smaller size units, lah, can go up to 2,004 per square foot. But again, when we do a comparison to, to Jaden, yes, different kind of product, different area. But if we're talking about per square foot wise and quantum wise, it's something that Singaporeans are still willing to accept, mm -hmm. right? So maybe let's share more about the developer, right? So our developer is actually an of view, private limited. So it's uh, led by TID, private limited. So TID is actually a joint venture between Hong Leong Group and Mitsui Photo Sun. Uh, they have the uh, concourse bending score of one. Right, which is the best, basically. Yeah. Uh, this kind of bending score is, is usually awarded to, you know, the developers or builders that has, you know, not, not a lot of issues in terms of like major defects. Mm. Yeah. And how does that translate to our buyers is that we are pretty much can be assured that the product is good. And uh, I think uh, defects check, don't need to check so much. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, just, a, yeah. it's a headache. Uh. It's a headache. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I used up three rolls of tape for for yeah. residents. So. Yeah. <laughs> ben scoring one gives them like 50% confidence really. Yeah. Okay. So these are some of the project that uh, TID was uh, involved in. Lentor Hills, Brownstone, EC. Yep. I think they also have some projection. Uh. Yes. yes. Okay. Forest Woods, Permon Grand, and of course the recent one ones, Eden. One North Eden, which is also 100% sold already. Yeah. So our architects are actually DP Architects Private Limited. So this architect firm, however, they manages these kind of subcategories as well. Okay, and these are the projects. 
that they are involved in. And these are actually quite well-known projects also. You know, Pai Lebar Quarter Woodley Residences, right? Yeah, Midwood, Mayfair Gardens. Okay. Our builder is actually Lian Beng Construction, right? Award-winning builder. Band scoring of number two. So number two is not so bad also. Yeah, one and two uh, is almost at the same category. It's really awarded to developers or builders with really not so much of a major defects. Well, Limbing themselves are also developers. So we have uh, seen some good products from them as well. And I think their recent outing at uh, Affinity was, was yes, quite well received. Correct. Yeah. So these are some of the projects also. They are also involved in Lentor Hills as well. Mm. So, you know, Affinity, famous one, Martin Morden, the Travel also, all did very well. Oh, I like Martin Morden. That yeah. was one of my favorite projects. Until Rive came along, yeah. <laughs> but you know enough names, uh, I can't buy. <laughs> no, I was a Rive, I see then. <laughs> okay. So maybe you talk more about the location. I mean, mm. Christopher has shared. So we are in the Lentor Enclave right now. Out of the few plots, we are actually on the bottom right, mm. you know, of the Lentor plot. Right, and within the vicinity itself, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of amenities, like the rest of the Lentor uh, plots. So... Just talking about Lentoria, right? We are actually five minutes away to the Lentor MRT. Yeah, even though we are at the bottom right hand side corner of the Lentor plot. Yeah, this five minutes is uh we walk ourselves. Huh? We will release we, the video because uh, we walk by the road. Correct, because so it's unblocked, so it feels quite short. Also. And and shouted all the way. It's shouted all the way. Yeah, because if you were to see like Google Earth and all, Yala is under construction, but actually the sheltered walkway is really it's really it's really done there. already. Yes. Yeah. So some project characteristics, okay. So um, Lentora will have a total unit of about 267. Our main con will be uh, Lenbing, Architect DP, and then uh, Unix, Unit Mix Type. We have one beta all the way to four beta premium. And uh, if you see the, the three beta premiums at 104 square meters, I think that's Quite sizable. Quite sizable, right? Yeah. And one more thing, this is the last project before the uh, harmonization of space kicks in with Lento Mansion. Which is, uh, you know, yeah. we have this kind of training after. Yeah. So we'll, have, well, we'll talk more about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we have a lot of four beta units as well. Yep. Yeah. Why? We will talk about it later also. Why is because Lento is also one kilometer this, to this Four very, schools. La. Very famous. SMS. Mainly I put I put number one because mm. this school I, I recognize. This is one of the top top ten that we talked yeah. about earlier. And 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 remember what constitutes a top school is very much the real estate. So again, if you look at it, a lot of landed properties on yep. the left hand side, and of course the condo land toilet enclave on the top. Okay. So who are or may be the potential buyers for Lentoria? So, I mean, research has shown that OCI actually has most buyers with the HDB addresses. Okay. Uh, we may be wrong, but, you know, it just shows that there's a lot of upgraders, you know, from HDB or BTOs, you know, coming into new launches of private property. Right. So, we have a lot of potential upgraders in the next few years because of the supply of, of BTOs uh, in the next coming years. And then when the supply five years later, you know, the MOP, then... Well, when they sell, they profit, they have to find a place to buy. Yeah, and this is actually largely, again, uh, what I shared earlier on, which is likely the Katip sites, the entire Katip sites that they were probably going to bring a lot more, you know, traffic to the Katip and uh, Ishun. Not so much Ishun MRT, I think Katip MRT. Katip MRT, yeah. yeah. Katip MRT on the left side is a bit underutilized now. Yeah. Okay. Then, to, these are the MOP units, la, HDBs in 2023. Uh, these are not the entire number. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pull out, you know, the MOP HDBs around Lentoria mm. because I do have my sellers that is selling their house in Bukit Batok, but they are looking to buy into Lentor. And that's because of school as well. And if you look at this map, it's actually quite clear because Lentor is really right smack central, in central Singapore. Yep. And, and, and with that growth plan that we talk about, actually we do, we'll see quite a fair bit of the upgraders from the Bukit Batok area, which is at like 3,500 units. And then of course, Tampanese 1,005 and coming into the center. And of course, those from Sambawang, the Canberra area, they are all made good money. Yep. They're going to come down. Yeah. yeah, the thing about BTO is they got no choice, la, right? There's only like every, every few months, they only have some specific. Well, I do think a lot of the BTOs may go first go up to the 
five year M O uh, five year ECs and then the the yeah. buyers for Lentorium most likely yeah. will be from yeah. that, that portion. It's just a slow progression, right? Yeah. Then these are the units that we can look out for also. It's coming to MOP in 2024, mm. right? So right now in the HDB market, I mean, just talking about third quarter of 2022 to third quarter of 2023, it's an increase of 10.4%, right? Uh, I feel, honestly, it's kind of stabilizing right now, right? There's not so many cases of uh, people selling with, with COV. That also shows that HDB is also coming to terms that the market has stabilized and it's uh, the prices are they, are, they are willing to support the price basically. Mm. Yeah. So we're also, you know, having more, a lot. More a lot uh. you, I think when we, back then, if we sell $1 million, we get featured on newspapers. I did. La. So I, I did sell a million dollar HDB in Commonwealth. Uh. But that was like pre-COVID. But do you get, get featured? The, no, uh, the reporter came to find me. Yeah. Uh, but, but they never Today, featured. Today, uh, you sell one million. No, but it's, go to it's newspaper, normal. It's normal. It's that's, normal. That's, that's the state of today's market. Correct. Yeah. So times have changed, right? So affordability is also another issue. So if, you know, people are buying million dollar HDB, then then do you think that buying new launches or private is difficult? I highly doubt so, right? So we zoom down into Amokyo itself, right? Our, our ERA agent did transact this million dollar uh, yeah. four room flat in Amokyo. Hero, hero. Yeah. And then talking about five room flats, brand new, five years MOP, they are all transacting above a million dollars. So it's just, people are just adapting. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do complain, but then we adapt. And they will pay. Singaporeans are <laughs> frogs in a yeah. warming <laughs> pot of water. So to reinforce what Christopher has shared, I think there's also very, very high demand for good schools in Singapore. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a parent, so I don't know. You are. So probably this will, you know, attract you when it comes to buying a property, right? So yes, we are one kilometer proximity to CHIJ, St. Nicholas Go School and Anderson Primary School, right? So I want to pull out Panorama. This is one of my favorite comparison, right? So Panorama till been 2017, right? But look at the transactions. This panorama has very, very, very high transaction volume. That's number one. And number two, I want you to zoom in and take a look at the price point per square foot. Panorama three beta is transacting at 2,000 per square foot, right? There are four beta is transacting at 1,009. So averagely, I'm talking about 1,008-ish to 2,000, 2,001, mm. that about, right? This is also very similar to the launch prices in Lentor, right? So acknowledging this, I want to tell you guys something also. Because Lentora has the same, almost, or some similar characteristics to Panorama. Yeah. So you guys go and think about why Panorama TOP in 2017 is doing so well in the resale market. Why are people paying new launches prices to buy a resale? Right? So Lentora is one kilometer to CHIJ, similar to Panorama. Right? We're also near the MRT. Panorama is not like right smack in front of Mayflower MRT. You know, they still have to walk, right? With probable same entry price. Yeah. So it's just purchasing a new project at a resale price. Yeah. So is it a safe entry price? I mean, to me, it is. So some of the exits point of uh, Lentora, which Christopher also shared. So let me just reinforce, right? So are we still, do we still have this first mover advantage? What do you think? I think we do. We and do, we, right? We have, I think we have gone through quite a fair bit to 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 share the long term demand. Yep. To talk about supply, and I think very importantly is uh, where the government sees uh you know Lentor in 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 their plans. Yep. And and I think uh we do see. I mean these slides have shown you know just here alone we have eleven plots. They have uh, released five, uh, six and seven are reserved, not been released yet. Yep. Right. So and 7 then, to 11 would so 11 probably be the phase 2, phase two of, of Lentor. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Mm. So still first mover advantage. Yes. Yeah. So when I, I guess, you know, remember just now we, we, we he talked about the, the uh, parallel being being a, you know, example whereby it launched at 2007 today is at 2000 plus. Yeah. I think that's largely, I would say also because of recent launches at the Lentor Modern, Hillock, Lentor Hills and us as well. And, 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 and what we are saying is that when... 9, 10, 11 are launched in a later date, I think we are, we are going to have that kind of a 
effect and impact as well. And, yep. we, and then that's where our profits are and, yeah. and that's where our exit point it is. It gives us a margin as well. Yeah, because the same, you know, characteristics that, that attracted people to buy Paranormal is going to be, is attracted to the Lentor part one. Yep. And we might have the well. same buyer profile. Yes, you know, and in, same fact, needs. in fact, I think when phase two comes, it will be a time whereby uh, some of the BTO plans have already be ready and, and definitely we're going to see a, you know, a, a, a northward uh, or a southward, uh, you know, expansion. Yeah, yeah, of, right. of, of demand. Right. Then, of course, connectivity. Right. You know, the Thomson East Coast Line tripled after opening all the new 11 stations, right? And within it stops to multiple interchange, right? And of course, this Thomson East Coast Line is links up the key employment nodes as well, right? And most importantly, it's towards the north, which is what you have shared, mm -hmm. right? It's more than 100,000 jobs is going to be created once this regional center yeah. is, is and, and of course the missing missing link here is actually that literally that bridge across yep. the sea to the Doom. world yeah uh, that's that's i think the uh our hinterland <laughs> okay then of course our north south corridor right which will definitely ease you know the traffic jams that you are facing <laughs> <laughs> looking forward yeah? yeah yeah okay then i think this is the interesting part Right, starting the master plan in the north region. So, I think this has been shared before, of course, right? Starting the master plan in 2014, moving towards the new master plan in 2019, we have a possible Targo MRT station. I put that possible, I mean, a lot of people say that it's going to come out, but we put the word there possible upcoming, right? Then the land itself, you know, converted from reserve site to residential use as well. Yeah, so it's a big, big, big plot of land. This is all in line with our observation of yes. Great North Plan. That's right. NSC is just part of it, but I'll call it a greater, like, you know, uh, East Coast Plan, <laughs> yeah. uh, North Plan. So so why release 11 plots in Lentor? Supp we're talking about supply and demand, right? Will there be new BTOs coming up? Highly possible, right? Then next thing we want to talk about, do we have a new cluster or estate in Yishun itself. This is the one that you talk about. Mm -hmm. This is the actually the portal trip up, yep. where auto is, mm -hmm. right? And they started chasing people out. Right? It, it was a reserve site as well, you know, for commercial usage. Mm -hmm. Then currently, it has been changed to residential use residential. as well. And it's also one one road up from Targo up to Yishun. And they conserve the old uh, bungalow that belongs to uh, the landowner in Yishun. Yeah. So it's, it's probably going to be, be a rest. one one of, uh, I don't know, it's going to be a, either it's going to be public, like a community centre, or it's going to be part of the, you know, a condo. Yep. Like, like you know, the uh, treasure trove. Yeah. Treasure yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then Congo, the Matilda house. Uh, yeah. they, they can't demolish it. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it's almost the same concept. Yeah. yeah but we're, what we're talking here is about possibilities mm. right, of, trans of uh, transformation. Right. Then I think maybe another news that people might miss out would be of course OCC. Right. Mm -hmm. So Orchid Country Club just, you know, renewed their lease uh, in 2021. Uh for another nine years to 2030, then there will no uh, longer be any further extension. So whether there are plans for residential or not, uh we don't know. But currently there's really a piece of residential land that sits right in the middle of OCC. Yeah. The Miltonia, Sky yeah. Miltonia, that okay. that shit. yeah. So yeah, I think there's a lot of plants in the north, big plants. My having it been right next to the reservoir, I don't think it will be commercial industrial. Like, <laughs> they, yeah, if you look at it L look at Pongo. Yeah. Right. Pongo North, North Shore, right? It's all right along the, the coastline as well. It, it'll unlikely be industrial. Yeah. It's too, it's too much of a waste for water. Well, this is this is our, our opinion, <laughs> la. Opinion, yes. Okay. So why Lentoria, right? Because we enjoy connectivity, the MRT line, you know, the North-South Corridor. And I think the, the behavior of, of government you know, releasing uh, maybe 11 plots of land, right? But only six plots of GLS, mm. right? Tells us a lot. Like they are just preparing for the bigger picture yep. in terms of North Plan, right? And prominent developers like Guaco, Hong Leong, just taking too much money in it. <laughs> the big boys have yeah. put in too much money already, okay? And I think the strongest reason, of course, why Lentora stands out, right? It's about what Chris has shared before also, 
I think it's schools are also a really, really a uh, big reason and a factor, you know, when uh property owners want to sell and want to move, it's usually, you know, schools, kids or parents, mm. right? Okay, I'm actually done with my portion.